So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Hearn. I am the Director of Litigation and a lawyer at Legal Services of Greater Miami. And today's webinar is going to be on illegal evictions. Um, this is part of a program that has been funded by Miami-Dade County um, through their Tenants' Rights and Education Program, um, which has provided funding for mo both materials about illegal evictions as well as uh, training materials and uh, training for the police department and these live webinars we'll be doing this week. Um, tomorrow we'll be featuring a webinar in Spanish and on Friday a uh, webinar on uh, Haitian, in Haitian Creole, the same webinar. Um, in case you're not aware, Legal Services of Greater Miami, we're a, we're a law firm that provides free legal assistance. Um, we work on uh, legal barriers to economic stability those are things like housing, like the tenants' rights that we'll be talking about today, um, issues of income, education, health care. Um, and we've been around 55 years. We don't charge for our services. Um, and at the end of this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about how um, you can contact us if you're in need of, of legal assistance. Um, I've been a lawyer here for 20 years and um, been doing tenants' rights work uh, this entire time. Um, and this is a really important issue. Um, and the county funded this because of during the pandemic, um, when there were moratoriums in place and many landlords could not uh, could not go to the courts and file a legal eviction. Um, unfortunately, we saw too many landlords who turned to um, illegal practices to force tenants out of their homes. Um, so while the courts are back open and, and evictions are are moving forward. Um, this is still an issue. It was an issue before the pandemic, and we want to make sure that both tenants and landlords know what the right process is and know what um, is prohibited under Florida law. So today, um, the agenda is we're going to go through, um, explain what a self-help eviction is and why they're illegal. Um, I want to make sure you come away from this presentation knowing what the law says um what a prohibited practice is that's the term that that we, we use in florida to describe um illegal evictions um what can happen to the landlord if the if they do engage in any of these illegal practices and what the tenant should do if if it happens to them um and and probably most importantly for both landlords and for tenants we really want to make sure that um, you understand what the eviction process looks like what, what steps the landlord is supposed to take if they want to remove a tenant, and so that the tenant knows what the process is if they are facing an eviction. And then we'll go over some examples. Um, hopefully we'll get some engagement from our, our audience, and um, then we'll have a moment at the end for questions and answers. So self-help evictions. Um, you know, before we had uh, statutes which protected uh, provided guidance, provided the law on, on how landlords and tenants interact. Um, so landlords could, in many circumstances, force tenants out of a property without using the court process. And, um, you know, that's problematic for a couple of reasons. And probably the most important reason, I mean, I use this as an example um, of a, a recent news story where uh, a landlord ended up shooting three tenants um, because he didn't want to go through the eviction process, didn't want to go through the court process. You know, sometimes uh, landlord-tenant relationships can get very, um, very passionate. Um, there can be anger on both sides, and and there are very unfortunate situations where both landlords and tenants sometimes take matters in their own hands, and we don't want that. We want an orderly process um, through the through the court system. Um, <clears throat> Additionally, you know, if a landlord can go in and, and say the tenant doesn't have a right to be there anymore, it allows the landlord essentially to sort of prejudge their own case. And, and it's, that's why we have a court system to make sure that um, everyone's rights are upheld. So what does the law say? So the Florida law prohibits um, a lots of different types of illegal evictions. And we're going to go over each of those types here today. Um, the, the statute which applies um, in these situations is, is Florida statute 83.67 and it's entitled prohibited practices. And you may see us refer to that uh, occasionally. I may say prohibited practices. And I'm talking about any of, any of these um, illegal evictions that are prohibited under the law. 
And this applies to all landlords and all tenants uh, for, for residential um, evictions. The statute's been here since 1987. Um, uh, you know, commercial landlords also can't use self-help, but this statute doesn't apply to them. So we're gonna focus today on residential tenants, which is the, the focus of this, this webinar. And I wanna point out that sometimes you're gonna see some leases, especially some form leases. Sometimes uh, landlords or tenants go online and, and download a, a form, uh, form lease. It may say something that says the landlord has the right um, to use self-help, um, but those lease provisions cannot be enforced in, in Florida. So what's prohibited? So probably the most common um, category of, of prohibited practices that we see in our office are utility shutoffs. And the statute says that a landlord cannot terminate or interrupt any utility, utility service of a tenant. And it gives several examples. So water, heating, lighting, electricity, gas, the elevator, um, if, they, if you need an elevator to access the unit, um, garbage services, air conditioning, um, so you can see that it pretty much applies to any sort of service that could come along that's part of the, uh, you know, part of the rental agreement, part of what, what a tenant pays for when, when they rent a unit. Now, there could be other utilities. I know that, that sometimes there are unique factors, and this is, an, uh, this is not a, an exclusive list. Um, you know, another common utility that, that, that is provided now is internet service. Um, and that also would be covered and a landlord could not shut it off. Now, the statute is very clear. It says that it doesn't matter who controls the utility service or who pays for the utility service. So the landlord um, you know, is responsible, cannot, cannot take steps to, to cause the utility service to be, be terminated, even if the tenant is the one who's paying. So, you know, in extreme examples, we see, we've seen landlords who, you know, cut utility lines. Um, uh, but there's also ways, uh, the statute says that the landlord cannot indirectly cause the termination or interruption of the service. So other examples of that might be a landlord who just, um, you know, stops paying the water bill. Um, and then the water service is cut off. Um, so that would be an indirect way of, of causing the termination or interruption of the service. And it doesn't matter if the, the tenant is behind on their rent. Um, there's the eviction process is the way you, you remove a tenant who's behind on their rent. You can't allow utility services to stop being paid or stop being provided to the tenant um, just because they're in violation of the lease for some other, other reason. But I do want to make clear that there, you know, there is at least one case where courts have said, you know, this is really designed to prevent tenants from being, from landlords from sort of forcing tenants out. And this, this statute does not apply uh, to a situation where a landlord is making repairs to the property for brief interruptions. Um, obviously, if it, was, if it was lengthier that this, uh, this exception may not apply. And of course, if a landlord is going to, needs to make repairs and there needs to be an interruption in service, the landlord should give advance notice uh, in writing to the tenant so that they can prepare um, for any sort of brief, uh, uh, you know, brief interruption in the services that they, they count on to go about their day. So like I said, utility service is probably the most common uh, type of illegal eviction. Um, the next most common, um, which is also covered on the statute, are lockouts. Um, and the statute is very clear that a landlord cannot change the locks, um, padlock the door, or prevent the tenant from gaining reasonable access to the unit. Um, so I think the most common way would be locks and, you know, locking the door. But there, there could be other things um, you know, preventing access to gates or, or other, other entry into the unit. And then there's a, a broad category, which I just sort of classifies illegal evictions um, that where the statute says the landlord can't remove the outside doors, locks, the roofs, the walls, the windows, 
um, or the tenant's personal property. And you might think some of these are rather extreme, and I, and I think they are. They don't happen a lot, but I've, I've seen almost all of these happen on, on, on at least one occasion um, for the times that I've been practicing. Um, the other, the other specific item that's, that's mentioned in the statute is that the tenant can't remove tenant's personal property. So a landlord can't enter a unit and take the tenant's stuff and, and remove it um, in a way to, in, with the intention to sort of force them out. Now, that is, of course, allowed by court order, and we will we'll talk about how the, the landlord gets that order to, to evict a tenant. Um, but there's also an exception when uh, the tenant says that... Um, when the, the tenant has abandoned the property. And the, the problem with abandonment from a landlord's perspective is it's really hard to know whether a, a tenant has abandoned. The, the statute says, the law says that, um, that a, a, a property is considered abandoned if the landlord has actual knowledge and knows that the tenant has abandoned, or if the tenant's been absent from the unit for more than half of the rental period, so half a month if they pay monthly, um, and the tenant is behind on the rent. But this exception does not apply if the tenant notifies the landlord um, uh, in writing um, that they will be absent. So you see there's a lot of exceptions to this. And I think most landlords attorneys would say you don't, you know, if you're a landlord, you don't want to risk it. You don't want to say, oh, I, I thought it was abandoned, but then it turns out that the tenant hadn't abandoned the unit. Um, and it's better to go through the eviction process um, the, the correct process to ensure that the landlord is protected um, and, and not accused of engaging in an illegal and eviction. Um, and the statute, once again, says it's, it, you know, obviously a landlord can remove the, the windows or the, the door if it's part of a legitimate maintenance repair um, and replacement. <clears throat> but of course, those should be short term. It should be secure if the landlord's doing that. Uh, a unit shouldn't be left open. Um, and exposed if a landlord is, is relying on that exception. So those are, the, those are the broad areas of what's covered under the statute. Now the question is, what happens if a landlord does one of these things? So if the landlord does a prohibited practice, it can be liable to the tenant for, for, for these three items. So one is three times the monthly rent for each, each violation. So if the rent was $2,000 per month, the landlord could be found liable by a court for $6,000 in damages to be payable to the tenant. Now, the statute also says um, actual or cons... Oh, let me back up. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. And that's for each violation. So if you have a situation where a landlord both changes the locks and turns off the electricity, then they could get... The tenant could could be owed three times the monthly rent for both of those violations. So $6,000 per violation times two, that adds up to, to $12,000 um, if the rent was $2,000. So the statute also says that the tenant can recover actual or consequential damages. So this would be things such as, you know, say you had the tenant had to go into a hotel or the, um, the, the, the tenants, the, the electricity being turned off caused damage to some of the, the tenant's personal property. So those could be recovered if the tenant could prove it was caused by the landlord's actions. But um, this only applies if it is more than three times the monthly rent. And as we all know, rents in, in Miami-Dade County are, 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 are rising quickly. So I would say in most circumstances, um, three times the monthly rent per violation is usually more than a tenant's actual and consequential damages. Um, there may be certain circumstances where that's not the case, but, um, uh, but in most cases, three times the monthly rent is, is the sort of standard um, damages that would be awarded. And then finally, if the tenant has to uh, hire a lawyer um, to, to bring one of these claims, the landlord would also have to pay for the tenant's attorney's fees and, and court costs. And of course, those could be significant if the case is heavily litigated. Now, in order to get any of these things, the tenant would have to bring a lawsuit against the tenant. Uh, I'm sorry, the tenant would have to bring a lawsuit against the landlord and prove their case up in court and have a judge rule that the landlord had violated the statute. Um, 
The other thing that the law provides for, and this is really one of the most powerful parts of the law, is that the landlord can sue, and as part of that lawsuit, can also sue and, and obtain a court order. And that court type of court order is called an injunction. Um, and that order could compel the landlord to stop doing the illegal action. So for example, the, the court could order the landlord to restore electrical service within 24 hours. And if the tenant, if the landlord does not do that, um, they could be held in contempt of court uh, for violating a court's order um, and additional penalties could be imposed. Um, so that, that often is um, when we're representing tenants and we, we file very quickly in court, um, often that's, oftentimes that's what we are trying to seek right away is to get that court order, to get the electrical service back on, to get access to the unit. So what should you do if this happens to you? Um, the first thing I would suggest doing is contact the landlord and tell them it's illegal. Now, I, I know that's not gonna help in, in many situations, but I will say there are some landlords who just aren't aware of the law, especially smaller landlords. Uh, maybe they, they only have one unit. They're, they're not really familiar with the, the legal process. They may not even have a lawyer helping them. Um, you know, give them information. I'll, I'll be sharing resources that we have available. Share that with them so that they know what the law is. Um, and if, and, and, you know, in some circumstances that, that can, can help you out. Um, the second suggestion I have is to call the police. Now, to be clear, the police are not going to arrest the landlord um, for, for violating this statute because it's not a criminal, it's a civil statute. Um, but they may assist. And as part of this training, uh, part of the tenant education program, uh, Legal Services has prepared a, an educational video for the police so that they're aware of what the law says. Um, and sometimes hearing it from, from law enforcement uh, may motivate a landlord to, to take action, um, especially in situations where, you know, the electricity is cut off. And we know in the summer that can be very, very difficult to live. Um, and third option, if, if this happens to you, is to contact a lawyer. Um, Legal Services of Greater Miami is available to consider these cases. We don't represent everyone, but we always, if you're eligible for our assistance, we give advice um, at a minimum. And um, we will, I'll explain in, in a moment how you can, can access our services. Um, if, you're, if you're not eligible for us, um, we'll talk about other options for you or could potentially find a private attorney since there are potentially fees, uh, attorney's fees that could be involved in this case. And if you had a lawyer, uh, even without a lawyer, you can file a lawsuit against the landlord, although it may be better um, to do it with a lawyer because um, you have to follow the court rules when you file a lawsuit. Um, and, and you can ask for an, that emergency order to order the landlord to restore the utility services to, to change the locks back. Um, and, and as part of our materials, um, which I'll show you in a moment, we, all, we have sort of a sample complaint that you can use um, if you do have to represent yourself. Okay, so what is the process? Um, what is the correct process if the, if the landlord wants the tenant out? So the very first step in any type of eviction is the landlord, um, like I said, they have to use this court process but the very first step they have to, to take doesn't involve the court. It's just a written notice to the tenant telling them to leave. There's lots of different types of, of notices. Um, we're not gonna go into a lot of detail here today, but this essentially is just a, a form notice to the tenant from the landlord telling the tenant to leave. If they're behind on rent, it may tell them to pay the rent. And if they don't, then to leave. Um, you know, sometimes we have tenants who, who receive those notices and think, oh, that means I'm being evicted. I'll be thrown out on the date that notice expires. No, that's just step one in the process. Now, if you want to leave before an, an eviction lawsuit is filed against you, and there may be reasons why you want to avoid that, because then you don't have an, an eviction filed against you on your record. But nobody's going to come when that notice, the, the notice expires um, and throw you out of the house. The landlord can't do that. The next step after that notice expires is at that point, the landlord has to file a lawsuit called an eviction in the court system. And the tenant has a right to defend against that eviction. 
Um, and when you get the papers from either the police department or from a process server, and they'll either be handed to you or, or someone in your household or posted on your door, um, you'll then have uh, five days to respond. And, and the document which you get will explain to you how you defend that lawsuit. One thing I do want to, to make sure that everyone's aware of is that if you get served with an eviction lawsuit in Florida in order to defend your eviction, in most cases, you're going to have to deposit your rent into the court and if there's any unpaid rent um, into the court. Um, if not, you lose automatically. Um, and we have information on our website, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, which explains how to defend against an eviction in, in much more detail. Um, but if the tenant loses, so the landlord wins the eviction, then the judge is going to sign an order telling the tenant that, that the landlord has a right to possession of the unit. That order is called a judgment. And they say judgment for possession. So that's the first step in the process. After the, the, the landlord has that judgment, they still can't come and, and turn off the utility services. They can't uh, force the tenant out. What they have to do next is get a uh, a document from the clerk of courts called a writ of possession. Uh, essentially, this is the notice which is going to be posted on the door um, to the unit by the police department. Um, in most cases in Florida, most places in Florida, it's by the sheriff's department, but we won't have a sheriff's department until, uh, until by 2024. Um, but that notice is put on the door. It says you have 24 hours to get out. Now, many times it's longer than 24 hours, but legally the, the police department can come back within 24 hours after it's posted on the door um, to remove the tenant. The landlord, the police will be there to um, keep the peace. You know, we don't want any violence to happen. These can be very, um, you know, traumatic experiences for, for especially for the, the tenants who are being forced out of their homes. Um, the police stand by as the landlord then is allowed to remove personal property um, from the from the unit and change the locks. So that's that's the that's the eviction process. I want to go through a couple of examples. Um, and so the first one I have is a, is Susan who's renting a room in her landlord's home for thousand dollars per month. Uh, she comes home to to find a padlock on the door to the room that she's renting and a note from her landlord telling her to pay the rent. So first question I have is, is this a prohibited practice? Now, it might confuse some people that, well, hey, Ms. Susan's not, you know, Susan's just renting a room in her house, in the landlord's house. She's not actually, you know, she doesn't, uh, isn't renting the whole place. Maybe she does not cover it under this, uh, under the landlord tenant statutes. But the answer to that is no. Um, she is covered. So this would be a prohibited practice. Even if a tenant's renting a room in someone's house, they are a tenant and the landlord has to go through the eviction process to remove them from the home. And then the second question is how much could the landlord be liable for? Well, if the rent is $1,000 per month, the landlord could be liable for three times the monthly rent. So this landlord, by putting that padlock on the door, um, if the tenant were to sue them, could, could recover $3,000 if they can prove their case in court. So another example, uh, another question, George is selling his property and needs his tenant, Sam, to move out. Um, and this is, this is a common circumstance as properties are sold. Sometimes the landlord wants the tenant out. Um, if the tenant doesn't have a lease, then they, they, the landlord may have a right to get them out, but they can't just force them out. Um, uh, so here, Sam hasn't left. So George stops paying the water bill and the water company turns off the water. So is this a prohibited practice? Hopefully you answered this yes as well, um, because Remember, the statute says it doesn't matter who's paying and a landlord is responsible whether they directly or indirectly cause the utility service to be turned off. So here, if George stops paying the water bill, then the water company turns off the water, then they have directly or indirectly caused a utility service shut off. Um, and they, the landlord uh, here, George, could be held liable um, for the water shutoff. 
And then the last example um, that I have is Mary is a landlord. She owns a condo condominium unit um, and rents it to Lauren. And Lauren fell behind on the rent. And because Lauren isn't paying that rent, Mary decided she's not going to pay the condo association anymore. And then the condo association turns off the FOB key access to the property and Lauren can't get inside the building. So is this a prohibited practice? So Mary, Mary the landlord didn't turn off the FOB access, right? Um, the condo association did it. The condo association isn't the landlord. But, um, but again, this is a situation, I would say this is probably a little bit of a closer call um, but we have brought lawsuits in this circumstance that the landlord has directly or indirectly denied the tenant access to, to, the, to the unit. Um, and, and this is something that um, you know, we see a lot um, and it's really important that if the landlord you know, has an association that they're paying, they have to keep paying the association. Um, even if the landlord, even if the tenant is paying the rent, if they want to evict, then they need to go through the eviction process for non-payment of rent. And, and there is a statute I just would like to mention under the, the Condominium Act, which says that a condo association can't, um, you know, can't prevent access to the unit for a tenant when the owner's behind um, for, you know, for access to unit or utilities or, or elevators. Um, but that may be, um, but that's not covered under this statute. It's a different statute. So I want to talk about resources. Um, as I mentioned before, we're legal services of Greater Miami. Um, we are we represent tenants only. We don't represent landlords for evictions. Um, and a tenant has to be eligible for our services um, based upon in income and other eligibility requirements. The best way to apply for us is to go online, um, fill out the application online. You go to our website here and then click get help. Um, someone will call you back um, within 24 hours to finish the, uh, the process. We also have phone, um, phone uh, access where you can call our phone number during the hour shown. Um, you may have a little bit of wait, so depending on how many people are calling. Um, and then we also, we're starting back our walk-in service again at our office next week on Mondays and Wednesdays at the, at the hours and time show. Now we have on our website, um, on our self-help page, and you have, once you click on that page, you need to scroll down a little bit, but you will see the tenant's rights brochures um, for a lot of different topics. Um, but the one that you want to look at about you, illegal evictions is what to do if your landlord locks you out or shuts off your utilities. Um, you can go there and, and, and as I mentioned before, it has a sample complaint um, that you can use and uh, gives you information that you could provide your landlord about what, um, you know, what, what the law says. And then um, for any landlords that are, are listening to this, or if you're uh, a, a tenant who is over income for us, one, uh, another option would be the Miami-Dade Bar's uh, Lawyer Referral Service. Um, here's the inform contact information for it. It does cost $50, but they, they uh, guarantee that the attorney that you speak with has um, expertise or handles these types of cases. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a service out there to help you find somebody who who might handle this type of case. Now I have an opportunity for questions. Um, I see that there is at least one question, um, whether the landlord can block access to the building parking lot or garage. Um, I, you know, my belief is that that is part of the, you know, assuming that that was mentioned in the, the lease agreement or any rental agreement, or even if you don't have it in writing, you have an oral agreement. You know, if it was always uh, known that you have parking, then that's part of the rental agreement. So that's a service um, that they, the landlord cannot turn off access if you're behind on. Um, and they would, uh, you know, if they want you to be, if, if they want you to leave because you're behind on the rent or violating any other provision of the lease, they need to go through the, the eviction process. Another question, do we only help people in Miami? 
So Legal Services Greater Miami, we cover um, uh, we cover both Miami-Dade County and Monroe County down into the Florida Keys. Um, if you're looking for assistance um, elsewhere in Florida, there is a legal aid or a legal services program in, in all parts of the state. And I'm going to ask that Elenia hopefully uh, can put into the chat the um, information for the online intake system statewide so that somebody can go um, can go on there, fill it out, and it will direct you to the correct organization um, in other places in the state. So I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, some don't see. So I think we've wrapped up the questions. Um, but as I mentioned, we will have two more webinars, one in Spanish and one in Haitian Creole. Spanish on Thursday at 12 o'clock, Haitian Creole on Friday at 12 o'clock as well. Um, so please spread the word for anyone who might uh, want to listen to this in any of the other languages. And thank you for attending today and thank you for uh, Miami-Dade County for sponsoring this event. Thanks everyone.